You must be 
ribbon of her mantle, there I did behold. His name and his surname in letters of gold. Young William O'Reilly appeared in my view. He was my chief comrade.
From there he came, we sailed away on the 24th of May. We were bored The opening lines to Paddy's Green Shamrock Shore, sung here by Straban and Paul Brady with the Johnsons, reminds us of that often perilous transatlantic voyage that thousands of our ancestors took. The River Foyle has been the point of departure for many thousands of immigrants since Columkill left for Iona, Scotland in the 6th century. Whilst the peak immigration time from Derry Cay was around the time of the famine, there was another exodus from Ulster that occurred around a hundred years before that would have a profound effect on the musical landscape of the land of opportunity, America. Scottish Presbyterians who had fled religious persecution found themselves in Ulster and many after a few generations boarded the ships bound for the land of divine providence. Many of these settlers moved to Appalachia on the American frontier and it was here that some 200 years later ethnomusicologists John and Alan Lomax found a vast repertoire of music that had its origins in Ulster and Scotland. Over the generations that followed, these traditional ballads and tunes merged with a diverse mix of songs of African American, German, French and Cherokee origin. This mountain music later evolved into country music in places like Tennessee and bluegrass in Kentucky. Fiona Ritchie in Doug Orr's excellent book, Wayfaring Stranger, traces that high lonesome sound of the southern Appalachian singing to the Shan No singers of Donegal. Quite simply put, without Ulster song, there would be no Nashville, a city whose booming economy is almost entirely generated through music. The next musical excerpt is from Ireland's first superstar, Derry man, Joseph Locke. It is an old Ulster melody known as the Bard of Armagh. it had become the Dying Cowboy or the Streets of Laredo. Here's the late great Johnny Cash performing the song with the requisite resonant pathos. As I walked out on the streets of Laredo As I walked out on Laredo one day I spied a young cowboy all wrapped in white linen Wrapped in white linen as cold as the clay. When the melody had journeyed to the birthplace of jazz, the amazing American cultural melting pot that is New Orleans, African American musicians changed the time signature and added some melodic variation. The song morphed into the jazz standard, a dirge known as St. James Infirmary. In this version, the great Louis Armstrong, the surname common in both the Scottish borders and Ulster, laments the loss of his true love. The words may have changed, but the song's sentiments remain the same. She was stretched out on a long white table So cold, so sweet so fair. Many prominent American country and bluegrass stars whose ancestors came from Ulster include Bill Monroe, the Everly Brothers, Loretta Lynn and her sister Crystal Gale, Emmy Lou Harris, Dolly Parton, and Roy Acuff, presenter of the legendary Grand Old Opry in Nashville. Bluegrass superstar Ricky Skaggs is very proud of his Ulster roots. He says, 
My family on my mother's side were Scots-Irish. They were the Fergusons who left Limavady in, in East Donegal in the early part of the 18th century. They eventually moved to Kentucky, where I grew up with a real taste for bluegrass music. And the soul of man never died. Stephen Foster, whose family emigrated from this city to Pennsylvania in the late 18th century, wrote over 200 classic songs. Among them, O oh Susanna, Hard Times Come Again No More, Beautiful Dreamer, Jeannie with the Light Brown Hair, My Old Kentucky Home, and Camp Town Races. Although Stephen Foster is most often remembered today as the father of American popular song, the particular musical genre for which the vast majority of Foster's hits were composed is rarely discussed in much detail. This, of course, was the first form of mass popular culture to emerge in America, and the country's first substantial cultural export, the musical genre known as the Blackface Minstrel Show. The image on the right of Blackface Minstrel singer Al Jolson offers an example of the way in which minstrelsy is most often remembered today. However, it is worth noting that Jolson and the early decades of the 20th century actually marked the end of the minstrel show and of a genre that had first come into being almost a century before that time. The image on the left, in contrast, offers an example of what minstrelsy comprised of in the early to mid 19th century. Although undoubtedly racist, with minstrelsy also came the first instance in American popular music of white musicians performing black music upon the American popular stage. Although by the early 20th century, professional minstrelsy had largely been replaced by later popular forms, such as vaudeville, jazz, and a host of others, it did not disappear. The continuing influence of minstrelsy was most keenly felt in country music and related genres, such as bluegrass and hillbilly or mountain music. Most of the founders of these genres, for instance, Roy Acuff, Bill Monroe, Hank Williams, and others, had backgrounds in blackface performance, most often through performing in their early years in medicine shows. This is one of the biggest forgotten secrets in country music history, but one that is just as complex as it is controversial. Both the free famine Scots-Irish and post-famine Irish diaspora in America featured particularly strongly in minstrel shows throughout the 19th century. However, the story of that Irish involvement is one that really begins in the final year of the War of 1812, America's first war as an independent nation and in the notable re-adoption of the Irish Protestant Unionist ballad, The Boyne Water. While the history of the Blackface Minstrel Show is a complex and controversial one, scholars of Blackface Minstrelsy trace the origins of the genre to the first Blackface song to be published in America, Backside Albany, a song which was in essence a rewrite of the revolutionary era ballad, The Boy in Water, but adapted to American context during the wartime crisis period of the War of 1812. Historian David Waldstreger notes that of the three national anthems written during that war, the other two being the Star Spangled Banner and the Hunters of Kentucky, Backside Albany was not only the first and the most northern of the war's three national anthems in origin, but was also the most popular of the three, despite being largely forgotten today. After its initial period of guest station in the 1830s and 1840s, in subsequent decades, the Blackface Minstrel Show would come to dominate American popular culture. The blackface minstrels were also particularly influential in introducing the banjo to the southeastern mountainous region of Appalachia, and without which later genres of country music and bluegrass simply would not have been possible. One of the most significant of all the blackface minstrel groups to achieve notoriety in the 19th century were Christie's minstrels, whose incredible success can be largely attributed to their specialization in the songs of Stephen Foster. Foster achieved his greatest success with blackface minstrel songs like Oh Susanna, a song that had sold more than 100,000 copies in America, easily trumping the previous record of 5,000 copies. Oh Susanna would become one of the most popular songs in American history, and much like Foster's Old Folks at Home, much of that popularity can be attributed to the performance of the song by Christie's Minstrels, a group originally formed in Buffalo, New York by Irish-American Edwin Pierce Christie. Formed originally in 1843 and lasting through to the 1870s, Christie's Minstrels were a phenomenally popular group, not merely in America, but across the rest of the Anglophone world as well. A 12th century monastic poet writing about the founder of this city, St. Colum Kill, beautifully encapsulates the melancholy that is so pervasive in the music of those who are forced to leave their homeland. Sorrow filled me leaving Ireland when I was powerful. 
so that a mournful grief came to me in the foreign land. This theme of exile and toil perpetuates and can be clearly discerned from the music of Appalachia as we're cast back to that high lonesome sound. Producer Philip King and Ulo O'Connor's stellar research and perseverance resulted in a joint BBC RT documentary film series that was first broadcast in 1991. The programme was called Bringing It All Back Home. This brilliant series continues to this day and features some of the finest Irish, English, Scottish and American musicians. One of the highlights of the first series was the Everly Brothers singing the well-known murder ballad Rose Connolly with Liam O'Flynn on the pipes. That was a song that Don and Phil learned from their father. They assumed it was an old Kentucky song, but it had actually been collected in Ireland in 1810 by Edward Bunting and Coleraine. I guess Rose Connolly was about, you know, it was like a newsletter about what had happened. Down in the willow garden where me and my tapestry that is Ulster song is something that we all share and can be extremely proud of.
When we be there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun, we long as days to sing God's praise. Then. The money that e'er I had, I have spent it in good company, and all the harm that e'er I've done, alas, it was to none but me. So feel to me the parting glass. Good night and joy be with you all. Of all the comrades that e'er I had, they're sorry for my God. And all the sweethearts that e'er I had, they'd wish me one more day to stay. But since it falls unto my lot that I should rise and you should not, how sweet. Rise and gently call.